Hey, welcome back to Recruiting Insight, where we connect you with the most successful recruiters, hiring managers, and innovators in the real estate industry. Today, we'll be joined by Scott Nelson. Scott is the CEO of Combing Shepherd Realtors in Cincinnati. Now, Scott's company, believe it or not, started just after World War II and embedded in business for more than seven decades. Scott's dad bought the company in 1968, and then Scott took the helm in 1990. So after the, over the last 30 years, Scott has built a remarkable company. Uh, they're number 166 on the Real Trend 500 list, and they're number one in market share in the Cincinnati metro area. Now, what you may not know is they're known across the country for the productivity and professionalism of their agents. Today, we'll be talking to Scott about his recruiting and retention strategies, and I think you'll find his way of running this part of his business to be quite remarkable. Hey, Scott, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, come on and uh, talk to talk to our, our audience about uh, some of the things you got going on at Coming Shepherd. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for asking us. Well, uh, um, so uh, so you and I have been friends for a long time, and uh, and we've worked, done a lot of business together over the years. But uh, I think a lot of people in the country don't know uh, too much about Comey and Shepherd. Uh, can you tell tell us a little about your company and um, and some about what you do with recruiting? Well, we've been around for a number of years. Um, started long before I was in the business back in the '40s. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a kind of a higher end company uh, in the early days. And um, now we do a certain amount of high-end business and a lot of general business, but um, I um, kind of changed the company philosophy 30 years ago when I took over um, to more of a quality versus quantity approach when it comes to hiring and recruiting. I didn't like the, you know, the part-timer model, which interestingly, is, is still just as popular today as it was 30 years ago. Um, you know, we wanted to have a sort of a better culture. We felt like culture is a palpable, it's almost like a product. And it's hard to have that when you have such a diversity of agents within an office in terms of has and have nots, producers and non-producers. You know, you, it's hard to control a culture with lots of people that aren't doing much of anything and are there for other reasons. So, so uh, um, yeah, and I think that's, that is so true. Uh, so how, how many agents, uh, how many agents and offices do you have uh, in your company? We have about 600 agents across the brand and we have about 12 offices. We do, we have some licensed offices where we act like, like a franchisor. So we don't, we don't own all the offices, but we brand all the offices. Okay. Licensing is a different, different structure than, um, Franchising that they're not independently owned, but it's worked, worked out well for us. Okay, so so 600 agents, uh, like you said, most of these folks, uh, at least your philosophy is that uh, that most of them are are full time, uh, and then there's a focus. There's a focus particularly on um, uh, on culture and, and being able to have a strong culture, strong full time professional culture. So so let's delve a little bit deeper then into uh, into recruiting. So so that being kind of the backdrop. What, uh, how would you describe your recruiting philosophies in light of that? Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. We just don't hire anybody who isn't transitioning to be in a full-time agent. Um, so many people get into the business with no plans other than to be in it part-time. Um, and we have a program we call, you know, new license that have been, agents that have been licensed for about a year and a half. Um, and it, just never ceases once a month, never ceases to amaze me, you know, how many people get into the business with part-time intention. So if, if you, if you take that hiring philosophy, then you're going to hire, you know, we, we could hire 10 where we might hire three if we just wanted to hang licenses. So the numbers are, you know, much lower. If we have an office of 60 people, we can do what a competitor's office of 150 can do because the productivity is higher, but it's a lot easier to manage 60 people than it is 150. Especially when you have the haves and have nots, as I say, you've got the productive people. I think what I decided was you have to have a you have to skew toward an experienced agent culture or a or a new agent culture. And although we hire a lot of new agents, we're hiring them and expecting them to become experienced full-time agents. So our culture is an experienced agent culture, not a uh, not a, a new agent slash part-time culture. 
Okay, so if we think just on numbers then, I mean, in, especially in the last couple of years, uh, especially since COVID, there's been a, a huge influx of people into the real estate industry. As you mentioned, a lot of those people get in with part-time intentions. Um, and uh, so what you're doing is you're taking a pretty large funnel, if you want to think about it that way, and you're, and you're saying, hey, there's a, there's a group in here that uh, either are planning or are already in full-time, hey, I'm, I'm going to quit my job or whatever, I'm going to do this full-time, um, or they're, uh, they're on the path to transition pretty quickly. So is that kind of the, the profile of the person that you would hire? Yeah, we certainly have people that don't quit that job the day they walk in our doors, but they have a clear intention to do that. And we've had cases in the past where people don't do that. They just they can't make that transition or it becomes complicated or whatever. And then, you know, we just kind of mutually agree that they're not, they're not for us. And they can all find a home somewhere else. Okay. So, so, so how does that, uh, so certainly it sounds like maybe you don't, uh, it's, maybe you have a, maybe you do, I don't know, maybe you have, do you have a minimum, uh, hey, you got to do this many transactions to stay, stay here, or is it just kind of managed by manager gets to make that decision? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, we, we have a stated minimum that we talk to new people about, um, and the managers, are, you know, look at their rosters ongoing and, and at the end of the year to sort of call out people that aren't. Uh, headed down the path, but certainly not everybody we hire and identify to hire works out. That just is the way real estate or any business is. Okay. So how would you, uh, how would you say that you, um, well, let's first of all, uh, for new people versus, versus experienced people, what percentage on each, uh, which area you typically in a typical year? I think it's, it's heavier on new, you know, 30 years ago, it was heavier on experience. We were a much smaller company. Um, you know, maybe it's 75, 25, 75 new, 70, 30, something like that. Okay. So, so you must have some, a pretty, I mean, obviously you got this culture that you've created and an expectation that you created as people come in, but you also must have a pretty good uh, training program or uh, a methodology that you've developed over the years of bringing these people up to this full-time, this full-time level. Yeah, I think so. We try to keep our, our hands on them longer. We've got a, you know, a, Field, what we call field training or sort of mentor type program in the branches in addition to you know branch managers um, and they sort of put the agents through some different paces in their first year in the business um, and that's somebody who the field trainers are people that are in the business and selling and so can take them out on appointments and things that a non-selling manager couldn't do so that's sort of an ad level of support um, we do a ninja installation every nine to 12 months, and that's kind of a, pretty much of a requirement for people to go through that program. So, yeah, pretty good, pretty intensive um, first year. Okay. So I've actually talked to one um, and interviewed one of your field trainers in the past, and it is, it is a remarkable program. Uh, and I think I've, there's a there's a Real Trends article that I wrote about that. So it's worth looking up in Real Trends if you get a chance, because uh, it Scott went through and or one of his field trainers went through and outlined the whole process there. So, um, but how does this, uh, how does this, what you do uh, differentiate you from your competitors? Do you see other people that are trying to do what you're doing uh, or most people, you know, back doing mostly part-time and just. Yeah, not really in our market. I mean, even if you look at some of the newer, you know, models and franchises that have come along in the last 10, 15, 20 years, they all have lots of part-time. Um, Nobody's nobody's taken that aspect out of the business. You know, a lot of the change. There's been a lot. There's been a lot of changes in our business. A lot of them have been, you know, at the procedural level, electronic like signature, all kinds of things, use of technology. But the fundamentals of the business, such as the hiring of part-time agents and the lack of productivity in the industry, haven't changed much at all in the 40 years I've been around. Yeah, that's, that's surprising that, that is, it's just maintained that the overall industry has remained the culture and you've been able to carve out this niche that has been resilient, uh, really, really sounds like for a couple decades. So, uh, so, so um, one thing you're known for, uh, people who, who know you and know your company is a, a very high level of per agent productivity. If you can't have a full-time model without having a lot of production, that, that doesn't work. So what's, uh, what's your average agent doing as far as uh, yearly, yearly transactions? We, you know, we usually do maybe two and a half times 
you know, what the typical agent would do, which I think if you look at NAR stats is six or seven units. So we're, depending on the year, um, you know, we've been as high as 18, 16 to 18, depending on the year. Okay. So, so of course, uh, that that average is being affected by people that are constantly ramping up uh, in as new sure. agents. So, uh, so you're well established. Once you see a, it, kind of the profile that you have as a well established, uh, um, eight, you know, full time professional agents, are you seeing them, you know, in the twenty to thirty range, pretty typically? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And and that's really the that's really the culture that you're calling people to, and that is that that full time here. We expect you to do twenty to thirty transactions a year. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you know, we have a we have still a very affordable market. Our average sale price is still just a hair under under three hundred. Okay. Uh, although it's gone up quite a bit, of course, as every other market has. But it's still, as you look around the country, you know, pretty pretty affordable market. So we're not we're not we're not doing it on. You know, we don't have a very high average sale price, but we're doing it on volume. We're doing it on, you know, we're grinding out the units. So. Yeah, so, so you got to do some transactions to, to make a living there, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like. Um, well, uh, um, so the, with that high quality agent, let's talk about the consumer for a minute. So obviously, if you have a lot of uh, part-time people doing real estate, you've got, uh, um, you know, uh, people that are pretty inexperienced, you don't have this culture that you have. Um, you know, the, 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 a lot of the things I've read recently is in the consumer side, there's this, there's this focus or call to quality, right? I, even in a buyer relationship, it's very difficult now with multiple offers. You kind of need a professional to walk you through this. Have you found that you've been able to serve your consumer a little better because of this model? Well, we've always believed that, um, you know, you, you hear a lot of people say, oh, I had a bad experience with the realtor once, and I'm convinced those were part-time agents in most cases. Um, and, and how could it be otherwise? But I still hear the stories from agents of, well, I've got a new listing coming up. Well, did you sell them a house? No, they bought their house from, you know, aunt or uncle so-and-so. Oh, why didn't they list with them? Well, they didn't, you know, they're part-time, you know, they didn't think they were competent enough to sell to, to list and sell the house. So, you know, they're, they're, people have loyalties for different reasons. And I guess, you know, they, they still don't want to go to Thanksgiving and get the hairy eye from, you know, a relative or a friend who they didn't, who they got real estate license. I mean, it sounds silly, but that happens, that still happens every day. And I've wondered over the years with technology and computerization and everything, if maybe we're not going to get to a point where people make choices about their agent differently. And that skews even our model because as a part-time agent, you don't have any portfolio, you don't have any flag to it. Um, so, I don't, I don't know that we've made that change dramatically yet. People still get referrals for agents from different sources and or they have an awareness of relatives and friends and have licenses and, and they have loyalty to that. And so you still see that, you still see a lot of that. That's, right. I think the, the part-time hiring model counts on that, that that agent will do one or two deals a year that they'll just fall into because a relative or a friend will call them. Right. That's the only expectation. It's it's interesting. It, it's uh, how this uh, how this in one sense evolves and in another sense it doesn't, and uh, at the same time. But um, yeah. let's talk uh, let's talk quickly about retention. So uh, so if you have a um, a lot of full time professional agents that are working in your company, which you do, um, there are some models out there. Uh, you know, I won't name any names here, but you probably can think of them that. Uh, that come into a market like yours or are already established in a market like yours and they have a habit of writing some big check to these types of checks to these type of producers to get them to move over. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you keep your your high performing agents from being picked off by these types of uh, strategies? Well, we have pretty, you know, pretty good aggressive compensation. So, um, you know, we try to be high service and high compensation, which is probably a bad idea, but it's worked for us over the years. So um, what we usually find is the, the compensation itself isn't as high. And so that signing bonus gets paid back, if you will, over the three or so years that you're required to stick around for having received that bonus. So for, for us, that's part of it. It's not, I don't think that's the case for all, all of our competitors, but. Okay, so so you do have to keep an eye on how you're compensating your high performers and make sure that it's it's financially yeah. advantageous at all times. 
Right. I mean, we don't leave a lot on the table. I, you know, I, I wish I wish there were more on, on our side of the table, frankly. But okay. that's, that's that's the way the business is, and, and it's not it's not the margins aren't the broker aren't getting any better, and they're not going to. Okay. Well, um, I, I you know I, I often talk to you know some brokers and sometimes team leaders that you know ex expect a, an agent to to be a little bit stupid, you know, a little bit uh, you know naive, or they don't really. Uh, they, don't, they don't expect them to really look at the details of their financial program. And it sounds like that, from your perspective, that's a mistake. You want them to be, hey, we're, we're going to assume these people are smart. They could figure it out and put a deal together that uh, is pretty compelling no matter who came along. Okay. Well, let's finish up by um, uh, offering some, um, hopefully some advice uh, to uh, um or to people who are not quite at your stage, you're a large established company, you have a pretty prominent brand in your marketplace, have multiple offices, all that. If, if you could put yourself in the place of, of someone that was just starting or had an office or a team that were just trying to grow, what type of recruiting advice would you give them? How would you go about that? Well, I think you have to, you have, to have some point of differentiation. That's what I was after when we became a productivity company all those years ago rather than what I call a me too company. Me too company is, yeah, we do that. Yeah, we do that. We're just a little smaller. Well, that's not compelling. Um, so you have to have something different in our business. To me, part of that was culture um, and a lot of other things you know, baked into it. So I think some kind of point of differentiation um, that makes somebody want to take a look and get something that they can't get anywhere else. And I don't mean by that just compensation. I mean the whole package of services and uh, culture and all that sort of thing. Right, right. No, that, that's good. And I think uh, being able to build that differentiation to, to have a unique value proposition that uh, that is unique. Uh, and it's just remarkable that uh, you've been, you developed this value proposition in essence, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I'm sure you've, you know, tweaked it and added to it along the way, but uh, really it's, it's been resilient, uh, remarkably resilient over a long period of time. That's, that's well, I tried to figure out what I thought a successful agent really wanted and, and skew to that instead of skewing to, you know, in the old days we had phone duty, you know, but the experienced agents never liked that because the newer oftentimes part-time agents um, would, would take the calls and never did anything with them. Um, and I think the experienced agents disliked that and resented that and didn't, it didn't represent the company well and it didn't serve the, the, the client well. It was the, person who owned the, you know, owned the listing. So I understand why that was part of our business, but I never liked it. And we, that was one of the first things we changed was to get rid of that. Those are the days when you still got a lot of calls into the office and you still ran ads in the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, well, just serving your client, right? Uh, you, you know, part of your client's your client, but then part of your client is the, the agent as well. So uh, super, super helpful. This, uh, it's helpful to see how you focused on that. Well, Scott, thanks so much uh, for joining us today and uh, you know sharing the amazing uh, details of your work. We really appreciate uh, your time. And, and uh, now for those who are doing the hard work of recruiting, go out there and make a difference.